I want to move on to the conversation now to uh, to bring in um, two individuals, Spencer Overton and Maya McGinnis. Um, Spencer is the president of the Joint Center for um, Political and Economic Studies, and that's a think tank that is focused on the future of work in Black communities across the U.S. And Maya is the president of the Bipartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Government, and that is a public policy organization that addresses federal budget and fiscal issues. Thanks, both of you, for, for joining us. Thank you so much, John. Um, Spencer, we just heard from, from Maya uh, about the state of the restaurant industry, but it, it's more than that industry that's at risk right now. B bigger picture, you know, I know it's a big, not very encouraging picture at the moment, but where, where else are the, are the wounds being opened in the economy? Well, I think if we look at vulnerable communities, there are particular challenges that we might miss in the standard discussion about this. And Latino communities, uh, Native American communities, and uh, African American communities, you know, they say uh, when the nation gets a cold, Black folks get pneumonia, and that's especially apt uh, here. Uh, Charles Blow and Connor Maxwell have written pretty eloquently about this. Uh, in Italy, you remember many of the people who died, like 75% of them had high blood pressure, 35% of them had diabetes, about a third of them had heart disease. Black folks in the U.S. are much more likely uh, to have uh, all uh, three uh, here. African Americans and Native Americans are more likely to have asthma. And so when we look at a place like Detroit, that's being especially hit hard by COVID. Detroit, which is 80% black, we see that showing up. Another big challenge is barriers to healthcare. You know, a lot of black folks live in the South. Many Southern states uh, refuse to expand Medicaid uh, under the uh, ACA. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, the Center of American Progress data has uh, shown that. Latinos are twice as likely not to see a doctor due to cost as, as whites, and, and Black folks are about one and a half times uh, as much. Uh, we are also not tracking race in terms of who has access to tests and, and in terms of COVID. So those are issues. I think another thing we can't ignore, John, is that people of color have more difficulty often adapting to a COVID world, right? They're, today, there are some children who are in school right now and others who are not as a result of a lack of broadband access. We found that about 15% of whites households lack broadband compared to 28% of African American households. And if you look in the South, the black rural South, that number is as high as 48% of folks who lack it. So work issues, uh, your, your, your last speaker talked about, Marvin talked about the restaurant industry, the five most popular black jobs, food preparation, cashiers, retail sales, nursing assistants, and personal care aides. These are all folks who are often on the front line and they've got a a tough choice in terms of do they go to work and risk exposure? Do they abstain from work? What happens when they get furloughed? Uh, so there are some unique challenges uh, that face the community. What, one other unique challenge is uh, household wealth. Uh, black folks, it's about one-tenth, about 17% is the net wealth compared to 170,000 in white households. That means that when you lack income and you've got time off, you just can't weather the storm in the same way. Okay, and, and I want to jump in on the point that you made about the five, the five most popular um, in, uh, professional opportunities. Um, anecdotally, are you hearing what choice people are making? Are they going out there and taking the risk or are they going home and risking not getting paid? Yeah, it is really difficult and it's different in terms of different households and in different places. And part of it is, do you take the risk and go out? And then there's also, there are also issues like public transportation in terms of you can't just often get in your car and go to work. Often you're exposing yourself on a, on a bus or a subway or something like that. So I think different families are making different choices. And part of the issue here is, lack of information and lack of being connected and and people again having to make those tough choices 
Maya, um, I, I want to broaden out a little bit and, and look back to uh, this time about a month ago when politicians and major news organizations and economists were also still debating whether what we're going through was going to cause a major recession. I don't think anybody's questioning us that right now, but why did it take so long really for, for, for the collective realization that the, the economy was so at risk? Well, if only our today selves could talk to ourselves a few weeks ago, right? All what, would, what would we say? Oh, well, we would have said, let's do everything differently, but we would have started first and foremost with this pandemic is one of the most challenging, devastating things any of us have ever seen, and we have to be all in and stopping it. Because there are gonna be a lot of tools that we're gonna to have to use to fight this economic downturn, and, and they're not going to be overly successful in that it's going to be painful. But the absolute most important thing that we could have done then and that we still have to do now is fight the pandemic head on. So as much as we can do to end, I mean, there's, there's a number of components of this crisis that we're in. There's obviously the health pandemic crisis, there's the economic crisis, and there's what I think we'll start to hear more and more about, which is the emotional and psychological crisis. And each one of them leads into the next. But in terms of economics, um, despite the fact that there's going to be so much disruption and pain um, and, and real suffering because of the economic downturn. Um, there is nothing more that there's nothing that we can do that's more important than tackling the healthcare part first. When it comes to the actual economic part, I think there are a couple things you have to think about. Right now, we have to think about alleviating the pain of people who have lost jobs, don't have income to get by, and the basic needs. Um, and are, are frankly terrified because it's already a terrifying moment and people don't have access to the economic resources they need. As we start to get our footing, and really I don't think we know when that will be, we're going to have to start thinking about how to make a recovery as strong um, and, and as painless as possible. And that means the kinds of things that we were talking about before with Marvin, things like how are we going to have resilience in our industry so that as we recover, people can get back connected to the workforce as quickly as possible. And I think there are a couple things there. So there's really three buckets of, of economic response you want to think about. The first is dealing with the hardships that are arising. And we had a stimulus package that did a lot to deal with that. The second will be how to keep con people connected to the workforce so that we can return as quickly as possible when the time is right and it's safe to. And the third is there are going to be permanent changes that come from this. There are going to be disruptions. We all are Zoomers now, right? We are going to do a lot more by video conferencing than we ever did before. The restaurant industry isn't going to return immediately to the way it was. As much as um, my home cooking is making me really, really miss restaurants, we are not going to be rushing out to restaurants on the very first day that we're allowed to leave our home. So we're going to have to think about how to transform some industries to deal with these changes. Likewise in education, likewise in travel. And so starting over the longer term to think about how we're going to target people into new parts of the economy if where they have been is going to change more permanently. We have a, a question from a viewer. And again, if you would like to submit a question, just go to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And there's a question for you, Spencer. How can we best support efforts around racial and economic justice during this universal pandemic experience? Uh, a wonderful question. And, you know, it's it's wonderful for us to think about how do we include and think about the needs of all Americans. I'm certainly very concerned about my immediate family, but you know, I think we also wanna be concerned about everyone here in, in our nation. And so you'll remember the GI Bill, which was thought of as kind of lifting all boats and you know, the creating the middle class, uh, unfortunately, that same bill actually exacerbated racial disparities because uh, African Americans really couldn't take advantage of the mortgage insurance and the mortgage benefits because they couldn't buy homes due to racially restrictive covenants and the mortgage didn't apply to black neighborhoods. Also, they couldn't take advantage of the tuition benefits because there were a lot of Southern schools they couldn't go to and there were particular quotas that prevented them from being included in northern schools and so it actually increased racial disparities so as we think about the next stimulus as we think about future policies we really want to think about all americans in terms of how we 
include them. So how do we have equity in terms of COVID testing when we have additional resources? How can we collect data along racial lines to ensure that everyone is getting health care? How do we deal with the digital infrastructure issue I met, dealt with uh, before in terms of ensuring that, uh, as Maya said, people are going to be, life will be different after this. So even after, if this period ends in two months, the world will be different. And how do we ensure that communities that have been excluded can participate in this new world? Then there are a number of other kind of economic things to help ensure that uh, uh, folks who are uh, dislocated uh, maybe don't have work requirements for SNAP and TAMP and, and homeless uh, assistance. We got to deal with the prison issue. I mean, COVID has been running rampant in right. prisons. How do, how do we deal with uh, those issues? So number of issues. Maya, um, you were talking about, you said the immediate need right now is to deal with the biological threat. And we have a, a question that's come in from, uh, excuse me, from, uh, I'm losing light a little bit. Um, it says that the South has been slowed, slowest to socially distance and the South possesses a population with higher percentages of underlying comorbidities for COVID-19 than the rest of the country. If the South becomes the new center of this crisis in the U.S. and reaches beyond what we've seen in Washington and New York, what will be the effect on predictions of a V-shaped economic recovery for the country? So there's actually a lot going on in that question, Maya. Yeah. Sort of presumptions about the, what it would mean in the South. Um, but, you know, it, are, is, is there at this point a, a slowness in the South that it needs to be dealt with? And is there too much of a focus right now on the big cities? And will, in the long run, uh, we have to take seriously the question of the South itself being uh, an anchor on any kind of recovery. Well, and again, as we all remember ourselves a month ago, it's hard to feel the absolute brutalness of this until it gets closer, until there are people you know. And, and you can sort of see kind of it's been, if you look at the map, and this includes the globe, how this is, has moved through different areas at different times and people have an awakening to what's really happening. And there's an immense risk that the areas of the country that have not been hit as hard yet uh, will not take the preventative measures that they need to. And certainly we all see photos in the newspaper that, that give us chills of people still out um, interacting with, with each other in ways that I think is quite dangerous. Um, you know, I don't think there's a letter for what this recovery might be because it could like be blips up and then back down and blips up and back down in that we don't know to what extent this virus is going to keep coming back. Is the fall going to have another outbreak of it? Are um, countries around the world where we think we've gotten on top of it going to have further outbreaks? And is this going to keep spiraling around? Are we going to be able to tamp down on it in a way that once we return, we really return permanently? Um, I'm not an expert on this, so I have no idea, but I know that so far this keeps proving to be more difficult and challenging than we are estimating. We're kind of letting the bad news dripple in a little slowly. Yeah. So I think we need to take measures, again, back to my healthcare first. We need to be taking measures to um, stop, the, stop the social interactions as much as possible in all areas of this country and in all countries, frankly. Um, but that also is major, uh, loss in terms of resources. And I think there people are starting to look at the cost of lives saved. It's unquestionably worth it, unquestionably worth it. But there is a cost associated with this in terms of lost incomes, um, lost wealth, and lost confidence about the future. Spencer, I want to shift to your other, one of your other areas of expertise, and you're an expert on elections. And my yeah. question is, how will this virus crisis affect the upcoming elections? And are, are there gonna be greater disparities in terms of who actually ultimately is able to vote and who's not? And you know, some people are proposing a vote by mail. I'm not sure that early voting is gonna be a, a solution in this situation, mm -hmm. but what's, what's your take and your concerns about the, the election of 2020? I think we have to be very conscious about ensuring maximum participation by all uh, different communities. So if we talk about vote by mail, how can we ensure that there's prepaid postage? How can we ensure that uh, there are some folks who can actually collect sealed uh, ballots and envelopes and submit them? How can we ensure that you can submit a ballot 
up until election day in terms of it being postmarked. So we need to take adequate uh, precautions so that we can ensure that everyone can uh, participate. I think another issue is the census that's kind of related, right, in terms of ensuring that there's uh, adequate time to uh, hear from everyone. There are a number of people who are not connected, as I mentioned before, in terms of online. And so how can we ensure that we have uh, an accurate census so that we can distribute resources fairly over the course of the next 10 years? Um, Maya, you, you were talking quite a bit earlier about the, the financial package as a solution. I, I just want to bounce back to 2008 um, when uh, the banks were rescued, the auto industry was rescued uh, at, at great expense, but there was, there was certainly a perception in retrospect that mistakes were made with how that package was put together. Are, there, are those mistakes something that we can learn from this time in terms of a government response to what we're going through? Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important question because there are both so many parallels and so many things that are not similar to the economic crisis that we endured in 2008 and after. Um, that, of course, was a financial market crisis, a financial crisis, and it was driven by mistakes that were made internally in our economy, where this is a global pandemic and an external threat that there's, there's no finger pointing at certain industries or companies saying you brought this on. So that's a first difference. The second difference, of course, is that fighting a financial crisis is very different than fighting a um, healthcare crisis. And <laughs> there, in many ways, the healthcare crisis is the great equalizer. Sort of nobody can escape this. There, there is no foolproof way to be um, completely protected against this. But I think what we learned from 2008, 2009 was there was, once we got through the crisis, one, people didn't understand a lot of the interventions that we had to take place, where we did prop up industries and we did put money into industries because they were connectors in the entire economy. So it wasn't as much that people wanted to save the banks to help bankers, it was because they wanted to save the banks to help the overall economy. That was never communicated in a way that there was sufficient buy-in. But I think the much more difficult part of that was af coming out of that afterwards, there was nobody who was held accountable. And there were many people who did incredibly well economically, who one thought, wait, the government helped them and subsidized these industries and these companies through the, the pain. And meanwhile, there are homeowners who lost their houses who were not subsidized at all. So that massive feeling of resentment and that this was unequal treatment persisted through the coming years. In many ways, it contributed to the, the pop, populist moment that we're seeing now. So a number of lessons. One, um, and I think this is more true in this moment than last even, act quickly and act big. And I say this as somebody who focuses on fiscal responsibility. This is a moment for borrowing and putting resources into every area that we think could stabilize the economy and the pandemic. But some of the lessons from before are communicate why you're doing what you're doing and make sure that it feels like people are treated fairly. There has to not be um, an ensuing resentment after this because that will leave us more broken. And I guess I, I would add a third, uh, another component, which is we've entered this moment broken and divided as a nation in many ways still because of the hangover of 2008, 2009, where our governance structure is more polarized than we've seen in decades. Our, our highly partisan environment makes anything done. You know, as a political independent, I just wish we could stop talking about Republican this and Democrat that. We have a national emergency, but politics is everywhere. And the question is, can we think of ways that we come out of this crisis more divided, more united rather than more divided? And I think there's some real risks there that we should be thinking about alongside as we're thinking about the emergency uh, me measures that we're taking at the moment. Just very briefly, if you would look at how we're doing in that regard so far, what would you give, what sort of grade would you give us on the getting along? You know, measures? I was really pleased they got the CARES Act done. It was too much grandstanding. There was um, the threat of a lot of unrelated components getting put in, and most of them were taken out. Overall, I would give high marks for that big third stimulus measure. Um, I guess I have a feeling of concern that, you know, it's also we have a big election coming and, and many people are rightly very worried about how that's going to play out and how voting will be able to be accessed and treated fairly. But I'm afraid we're going to return to our partisan corners. And another thing, um, somebody recently pointed this out, that at moments when a country is at great danger because of an external threat, a terrorist attack, a war, it can serve to unify the country. 
but when that same thing actually leads to issues of scarcity, which is what we are seeing here with our hospitals and our healthcare and our protective equipment, that, can, that scarcity can lead to more infighting. And I'm so worried that right now we have a political env environment that continues to throw um, you know, more, more onto that fire and make things hotter and angrier. And I, what I hope is that the local sense of community that's building massively throughout the country can dominate the high sense of partisan politics that I feel come. But I will say on that first CARES Act, I was really pleased and relieved to see how quickly they were able to put together an overall really excellent bill. Really, let, let's hope that's a harbinger for the future. Maya and Spencer, I want to thank you so much for, for joining us today. And we would love to have you back. Uh, your insights were really, really useful. And thank you very much for taking the time today. Thanks, thank John. You.